So this, um, this breakout session is about internal organ involvement, and I'm delighted that, that Diane's um, coming along to tell her story, and we'll, uh, I'm sure you'll be able to um, equate with some of the things that she's going to tell us about. So what we're going to do, uh, it's a half-hour session, and I'm going to run through uh, a little bit about, uh, about internal organ involvement. It'll be, and I'm going to go through things in, in fa fairly quickly, but there'll be the opportunity to ask things afterwards, because I think that's um, probably best. So, um, so what do we mean by, um, why do people with scleroderma develop so-called internal organ involvement? And I'm not going to talk about, you've heard a huge amount this morning already about what causes scleroderma. So I'm just going to say that you, know, you get these different um, processes that occur in scleroderma. We get this fibrosis or scarring, the problems with the blood vessel and the immune abnormalities that you've heard a whole load about with the autoantibodies. And the reason that I mention this is just to put into context that the reason people get internal organ involvement is that, and by internal organs, we mean that the bits inside you, the heart, the lungs, the gastrointestinal tract, which goes right from your mouth right down the back passage, and then the, 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 the kidneys. And so these organs get affected, or at least they can do, by the scarring process and also by the poor blood supply and various different combinations of these things. So that's why the internal organs get involved. And they don't get involved in e everybody by all matter of means, but, um, but some people unfortunately do run into problems. And it's something that we know a lot about and we try and pick up at an <coughs> early stage. So this just shows a slide, and I've put in yellow the things that I'm going to touch on and briefly just have <coughs> a discussion. You can get to the <coughs> of the heart, of the kidneys, and of the lungs, and there are two different points here because you can get fibrosis of the lungs that I'll come back to, and you can also get a condition called pulmonary hypertension, sometimes actually secondary to the lung fibrosis, but sometimes, as I'm going to say, because of a problem with the pulmonary arteries themselves, these are the arteries, the big blood vessels that go from what we call the right side of the heart to the lungs. I'm not going to mention the gastrointestinal tract. I'm happy to discuss it, but Liz Harrison, some of you will be going to Liz's breakout group, and she's going to be talking all about gastrointestinal disease, so I'm not dealing with that um, unless anyone wants me to, but that's obviously a, a big problem for, for many people. So we're going to cover, um, first of all, I, I know that Diane's going to talk more about this, but just um, the kidney and what can go wrong with the kidney. Um, the, the, the thing that we dread most as, as clinicians with an interest in scleroderma is that some people, as has been mentioned this morning, develop a condition called scleroderma renal crisis. And we know a lot, and I think one of the huge advances in the last um, um, few years has been the recognition of who is at most risk. And they're the patients, as we heard earlier this morning, with early disease and diffuse disease. Although, you know, occasionally other, other patients can get them too, but ma mainly accelerated hypertension, as it's sometimes called, or scleroderma renal crisis, happen early on in the disease and then people with what we call the diffuse cutaneous subtype. That means that the skin um, involves not just the hands and the feet, but higher up to the what we call the proximal limbs, the thighs or the upper arms or the trunk. And these are the people who are most likely to get a scleroderma renal crisis. And the blood pressure can rise very suddenly and, um, and so we need to watch out for it because it is a treatable thing, but we need to get it early. And because of this, we, as was said earlier today, we advise people to very regular blood monitoring, blood pressure monitoring, preferably if people are happy to, to monitor their blood pressure at home so that you can check any rise. And it's important if you develop any new symptoms, for example, headaches, sudden onset of breathlessness, that these, of course, may have other causes. But if you get anything that's unusual, then especially if you're in one of these high-risk groups, you know, with the early disease or the diffuse disease, straight off to get your blood pressure checked. And if it's high, then you will need to come into hospital to have that um, sorted out. So that's all that I'm going to say just now, because I, I know we'll be saying possibly more about that afterwards. So then we come to the lung involvement. Now the lungs are, um, are commonly affected in scleroderma, but sometimes it's really very minor. You can have very minor degrees of lung involvement, but unfortunately you can have much more severe um, forms of lung involvement. 
And we sometimes call lung involvement pulmonary involvement. It's just another way of saying the same thing. So there are two major types of lung involvement that you get, or you can get. And one of them is the fibrosis, that's the scarring of the lungs, which starts off at the bases of the lungs. And I, I'm going to say a little bit about more than that afterwards. And the other type of lung involvement that you get is this condition called pulmonary arterial hypertension. Now, it's a little bit complicated, but pulmonary hypertension is, is one thing, and pulmonary arterial hypertension is a subgroup within pulmonary hypertension. It's one of the causes of pulmonary hypertension is pulmonary arterial hypertension. And so pulmonary arterial hypertension is a problem. It's not so much, it depends how you define it. Some people wouldn't say that that was lung involvement. But uh, for the purposes of just now, I think we can consider mm -hmm. it lung involvement. It's involvement of the artery that goes from what we call the right side of the heart to the lungs. It's a problem with that artery. And that these arteries can, or at least the right and left one, but they can become involved in, in scleroderma, particularly in, in, in the more sort of vascular type of scleroderma, as we heard earlier today with the centromere antibody and the, the limited type. Whereas it's interesting because lung fibrosis, because of back pressure from the lungs, it can cause pulmonary hypertension, but there isn't pulmonary arterial hypertension. So it can be a little bit confusing, I'm happy to, to dis discuss it. But basically, um, you know, when you measure blood pressure, when people say that they have hypertension, most people, they mean the sort of hypertension that you measure with uh, a, what we call sphygmomanometer. And that measures the pressure at the left side of the heart. Measuring the pressure on the right side of the heart is much more complicated. But that's the problem that we can get in scleroderma. So what might you complain of if, uh, to warn you that you might have one of these things? Well, the symptoms of lung disease are that you might complain of breathlessness. Um, people with lung fibrosis can have a cough. It's often a dry cough. And you occasionally get other symptoms, for example, swelling of the ankles, although there are a whole lot of reasons why people get, get ankle swelling, so it may be nothing to do with it, but you sometimes can get ankle swelling. And what sort of tests would your doctor ask for? Most people with scleroderma will at some point, probably at first, visit have a chest x-ray. That will show up extensive lung fibrosis. It won't show up very minor degrees of lung fibrosis. Um, an echocardiogram, that's a test when you, it's a cardiac ultrasound, when you get some jelly in the chest and someone tips you over on the left-hand side and looks at the different heart chambers. That's useful to look for pulmonary hypertension. You can't diagnose pulmonary hypertension from an echocardiogram, but you can suspect it. Breathing tests, pulmonary function tests, they're useful for detecting both pulmonary hypertension and lung fibrosis because you get different patterns of abnormality in the lung function test. These are the tests when you usually go into a big sort of box thing and have to breathe in and out for the pulmonary function test. So most people with scleroderma will be recommended to have these tests quite regularly, every one to two years, so that we can look and see whether there are any problems developing. Because the problem is that if you're very fit, you know, and you can run up um, three or four flights of stairs, you're very unlikely to have any of, of these things. But the problem that with scleroderma, unfortunately, often you're not terribly mobile, or at least you might not be because of joint involvement, skin involvement, muscle involvement. And so we can't necessarily tell if someone's breathless. So that's why we have to do these additional um, tests. And they're very sensitive to pick up abnormalities. We often get an ECG or an electrocardiogram. In fact, we, we usually would. That's just a very straightforward test. Um, an HRCT scan, that stands for High Resolution um, Computed Tomography. That's a test that you go in and it's a sort of donut thing, it's a very quick <coughs> test. But that's very sensitive <coughs> for looking at lung fibrosis. It will show minor degrees of lung fibrosis as well as more extensive lung fibrosis. And we probably wouldn't repeat this test several times, but we would probably do it you know, at, at one or more points, just depending on the clinical situation. If as a result of the echocardiogram and the pulmonary function tests, we suspected that someone might have pulmonary hypertension, then we would, we, the, the individual needs to have further tests because 
and that test, these tests are more complicated. And the system in the United Kingdom is that we have different pulmonary vascular units. For example, I work in Salford and Manchester, and we refer to Sheffield for further investigation because that's our nearest pulmonary vascular unit. So if we were worried that someone might have pulmonary hypertension, then we would refer them to Sheffield, and they might do a test called a right heart catheter, and they might do some additional tests. Okay, so this is just to give you an example. This is a chest x-ray. It's not a good chest x-ray at all, I'm afraid, but you can maybe see that there's a whole lot of mottling in these lung fields that ought to be clear. And this particular patient had very advanced lung fibrosis. <coughs> they, they also had uh, an enlarged heart because they, um, they had a problem there as well. And this is just to show you the sort of picture that we get with an HRCT scan. This is what's called cross-sectional imaging. So they essentially do a number of different slices up and down you like that. And you can see this patient has some abnormalities here, um, which show that they have some lung fibrosis. And so what do, how do we treat lung fibrosis? Well, we usually um, advise, uh, well, I say usually, but if, if it's severe or if it's getting worse, then most doctors would recommend that you have an immunosuppressant drug if that's appropriate for you to dampen down the immune system. And the ones which are used are cyclophosphamide and a tablet called mycophenolate mofetil. And I'll just put this up quite, quite quickly. This is a paper, a big study, which was published last year. And this is the one of the lung function tests called the force vital capacity. And you can see that with either treatment, the lung capacity improved a little bit. It wasn't that great, but there was a slight improvement, and at least it didn't get worse. So that really provided some of the evidence base for giving these immunosuppressant treatments. From the point of view of pulmonary arterial hypertension, I think it's been, quite, it's been exciting over the last 10 to 15 years because really there have been a whole load of new drugs that have been shown to bring some benefit to pulmonary hypertension. Unfortunately, they're not as good as we would like them to be, but there are a number of different options. And I'm not going to go through all of these. Some of you, maybe one or two of you here, have got pulmonary hypertension, and you'll recognize these groups of drugs. But I just mention them because they're actually different pathways, and um, because we know more and more about the causes of pulmonary hypertension, we think that there's too much activity of this pathway, the endothelium pathway, so we want to block it with one of these drugs. We think there's not enough activity of these two pathways, and so we want to supplement them with these drugs. So, and sometimes we, in fact, quite commonly, the, the respiratory physicians use a combined approach, and they give you combinations of these drugs. So, for example, you might be an ambrosentan, which would be um, opposing this pathway, and you might be, have that in combination with tadalafil, which would supplement the nitric oxide pathway. So they're very often you know, combinations of drugs. And, but as I say, these in, in this country, these drugs um, and the combinations of drugs tend to be directed by the pulmonary vascular units. So we're very grateful to our colleagues in the pulmonary vascular centres um, for, for helping us out, out there. Um, the heart, that's the last um, organ I, I want to deal with before, before um, passing over to Diane. But there are different types of heart involvement. There's possibly a little bit less known about the heart and scleroderma than the kidneys or the heart or the, or, or, or the kidneys or the lungs, sorry. But, but it's interesting because there's a big interest now because of the imaging techniques, for example, a type of imaging called magnetic resonance imaging, you know, can visualize a heart. And I think because of that and because of other uh, advances, it's easier to study the heart than it used to be. And so we, we are learning a lot more about it than we used to, 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 to know. And there are different types of heart involvement. The pericardium is the, la the thing that the structure, the sac that surrounds the heart, and that can become involved in scleroderma. You can get fluid in what we call the pericardial space. The myocardium is the muscle of the heart, and that can sometimes become involved in scleroderma. And you can also get um, <coughs> what are called conduction abnormalities, because the heart has what we call a conducting system, and it can, it can result in the heart either going too fast or too slowly, you know, sort of a little bit paradoxically. And we need to be aware of that possibility in those of you that have scleroderma. So the symptoms of heart disease are a little bit like lung disease. You know, people may develop breathlessness or ankle swelling or complain of palpitations. Occasionally you can get some chest pain, although that's um, a bit less common. So again, this is just an example of a chest x-ray. This uh, um, person's got a great big um, heart 
and that's much larger than it ought to be. This is a heart here that you're seeing. These are the lung fields that are quite clear. But, and this person had what's called a pericardial effusion. You know, they had fluid um, surrounding the heart, which um, had to get um, treated. And this is just an ECG, a cardiograph. Many of you here will have had a cardiograph. And you have to take it from me, this heart's going far, far too quickly. So that's um, not good news. And this was secondary to uh, a scleroderma-related um, problem. So, so there we go. So, so we've covered a few of the organs, you know, the kidney. And uh, the kidney, you know, as it was mentioned earlier today, 30 years ago, kidney involvement, um, renal crisis was just a complete disaster. And, and very often, I'm afraid, um, ended in the person dying. But now there are, there are, there are good ways to treat um, kidney involvement as long as it's got quickly. And, um, and so we can help out there. And I think there are quite a lot of treatments now for lung fibrosis and pulmonary artery hypertension, not as good we would, as we would like them to be. And we're learning more about the heart. So I think the, the bottom line is that it's important to be aware of the possibility that these, uh, these problems might develop. Sometimes they can be very mild. It's very, very common to have very mild lung fibrosis and scleroderma. In fact, most people have some lung fibrosis. And the key point is whether it's a problem that's progressing or is severe. So not everyone with these problems will, will require treatment. And they may not be much of an issue at all, but it's important that we, we pick them up. So I think what we'll do now is we'll hear from Diane. My journey began in 2012. Um, I was actually diagnosed on the 29th of June in 2012, which is a bit of coincidence. It's World Scleroderma Day. Um, my first symptoms started about eight weeks prior to my diagnosis. It was a very dramatic entrance to the medical world, and it was only look, I think, from my GP's point of view, is that I reacted to which is interesting after the talk this morning about triggers, um, I used gel and gloves in a hospital visiting because there was an infection and within an hour my hands had swollen and were itchy, carried on, my body swelled, my feet swelled and then I had to go to the GP and um, they did a blood test that said it was an allergy. I had some antihistamines really strong each day for about three weeks and then the swelling went down a bit but my hands were left clawed. So I went back to my GP and as soon as she saw my hands, she said, you need to see a rheumatologist because she'd done her training in Bath and they see a lot of rheumatic conditions. So four weeks later, I was going through the tests. Um, I got the confirmation of what I had, which was the diffuse form of the scleroderma. And they said it was quite aggressive. So I was given one pulse of the cyclofloss drug and then 10 days later, I was in intensive care with the renal crisis. So it all happened dramatically. Um, I then was transferred to the Royal Liverpool, where I was there for 15 days, and I had the kidney biopsy, blood transfusion. Um, I was in high dependency, and then at the end of 15 days, I had a 6% kidney function, so I had to go on peritoneal dialysis. So it was just a whirlwind of events because they weren't sure I could handle doing the di dialysis, which for those of you who don't know, it's like sort of your membrane in your stomach area that covers the organs. You empty a, like a glucose fluid in four times a day, empty it out, and that's what kept me alive. So after about six months, seven months, I suddenly got a little bit of life in my kidneys, so mm -hmm. they decided to wean me off the dialysis they kept the tubes, as I call them, um, in there for about another three months just to make sure, mm. and then they removed that, and then my kidneys improved a little bit. Um, it impacts on so much, the kidneys. I didn't realise what the kidneys did until this happened. You've got to be so careful with your diets, your phosphates, your potassium, what you can eat, what you can't eat. My friends are so well up on it now. They used to dread me coming out for lunch because they didn't know what to give me. Um, and at the minute, I'm on, well, my, my official kidney title is Residual CKD4, which is pretty low. It's 15 to 28, but it's a lot better than six. Um, they go up and down quite a lot. It affects an awful lot of what treatments I can have, what drugs I can have, because I have got heart involvement as well, and they needed to do an angiogram, but my kidneys weren't up to the level that they could do the dye, because the dye can damage the kidneys. 
So eventually, after a lot of discussion, I was put on fluids during, before, after, and they did the angiogram and they've diagnosed me with small vessel disease, cardio X and angina. Um, so, and the drugs, everybody, you mentioned kidneys, they all back off and say, no, we've got to watch the kidneys because of the pathway of trying different drugs and, you know, whether it's intravenous, that's why I've got the pick line in, or, or the tablets, and they're now discussing, because I'm under Aintree Hospital now as well as my own rheumatology at St Helens, and they're looking at bosantin, um, but again, there's, there's questions about kidney <coughs> involvement and if that would impact on it. Um, my passions in life, um, part of what I try and do is keep positive. I am a very positive person, not all the time, but I try to be. And during all this process, when you go within a few weeks of being absolutely no problems, and I've been to the doctor in my life to go on dialysis and they're talking transplants, you, you don't know where you are. So once things <laughs> have settled down, I'm trying to regroup the things that I enjoy. Um, and also to help other people as well. One of the things that I do is painting. I do portraits in um, watercolours. I also do um, animal portraits and I do them for commissions and give it to the SRUK. I did £250 from a local um, rheumatology and the kidney unit in, in Liverpool. I have to adapt things because it's really hard to hold and I haven't been able to do it while I've had the ulcer because I've got my every finger at the moment. Um, but I'm actually starting an art therapy class up for people with long-term conditions as well because I do believe that it's a bit of an escape for people. No matter what things you've got, you can do something about that. <coughs> However, my appointments at the moment with hospitals, um, I think for the last three weeks, I've had one day off from appointments and sometimes I've been in three hospitals because I, I actually currently, my kidneys are in Liverpool, <laughs> my heart's in Broad Green, <laughs> um, the rheumatology is between Aintree and, and St Helens and Wisdom. So they do take up a lot of time and the consequences of having stage four kidney disease and the scleroderma fatigue can catch up with you um, with the tiredness as well. <coughs> Um, what I've also done, though, is I've made some fabulous friends, a lot more, on this conference. And it is really good to talk to people, to go through different experiences. And this is just my experience of um, just one part of me that's involved in the scleroderma. And people have different bits and different examples, because I know some people have had to have transplants, hopefully. Um, fingers crossed I won't. Although, at the moment, um, there was a question mark because I've got major problems and my blood pressure's gone sky high and there was a question mark over a second renal crisis which is very rare but um, it was mentioned. Um, I'm actually part of the support group for SRUK as well so I actually talk a lot with people on the phone and meet up with them and met a lot of people that I've talked on the phone today to put a face to the name. So. From my experience, I can pass through things, but I'm always very conscious of saying everybody is so different and, you know, don't take on board everything that I'm sort of saying. And they pass through things to me, which I can then pass on through to SRUK as well, because if I get five people saying the same thing, then there's obviously a, an issue that we can help with. But for me, my kidney story is an ongoing thing to be continued, <laughs> perhaps at the next conference. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's me. Okay. <laughs>